Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains inept in so many ways. And today, we are going to discuss the fall of of the Milwaukee Road. It was a rail line in the northern United States that survived quite a long time, over a hundred years it was around, but during that time, and especially towards the end, it spiraled out of control and made just so many questionable decisions. Its fall wasn't entirely due to these decisions though, as some of it had to do with a lot of government oversight that kind of screwed them over multiple times, but... Their story is rather amusing, to say the least, and I've had more than one person ask me about their fall. This is the story of the final bankruptcy of the Milwaukee Road. But before we get there, a special word from our, uh, sponsor? Thank you so much for inviting me on the show once again to sponsor this exclusive content for the New York Central Railway. As you all know, I am Alfred E. Perlman, and I have come to advertise a few, shall we say, pieces of merchandise. Such as how British Railways would like all of the Class 17s. Or perhaps you want to be more like me and let the world know that you want that steam engine. And there's also the final piece of merchandise, Big Chungus, which... Is that a steam engine on that t-shirt? I want that steam engine! It's just a shirt, Alfred! It's just a shirt! I don't know what a steam engine is, but I know what a shirt is! Click the link in the description before Alfred destroys all the merch! Quick, run! The Monkey Road survived for quite a decent amount of time, and it had its ups and downs over the years. It began official operation in 1847 known as the Milwaukee and Waukesha Railroad, although almost immediately they would change their name to the Milwaukee and Mississippi Railroad. Eventually, they would come to be called the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad, or CM, St. P, and P, which, no matter how you say that, that's a mouthful, and they must have known it, because generally people, even in the company, just referred to the rail line as the Milwaukee Road. Even their logo called it that. Though they survived for that whole time, they actually went through multiple bankruptcies. It's just they always managed to reorganize or be held in receivership until the situation improved. One of their first mistakes that shouldn't have been a mistake, but it turned out to be, was their Pacific extension. In the 1890s, they felt they had to extend the railroad to the Pacific to remain competitive. This isn't unreasonable. In 1901, they estimated the cost to do this is $45 million. That's $1.47 billion today. So this was a massive project. And in 1905, they actually approved the project, which was estimated then at $60 million, or $1.81 billion. Construction officially began in 1906 and was completed in three years. The route chosen actually wound up being 18 miles shorter than their next shortest competitor's lines. But it was also very expensive, as the Milwaukee Road received very few government grants for territory regarding building this project, so they had to buy most of the land or acquire smaller railroads that were in the area. It was a rough area to build in, and this was over the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades. The civil engineering that it took to accomplish this feat was not cheap at all. Additionally, while the route seemed good at first, historians point out now that it bypassed a lot of major population centers and passed through areas that had very limited local traffic potential. So, in some ways, it wasn't necessarily an ideal line in terms of efficiency. It also tended to parallel the Northern Pacific Railway. Even once it was done, operating conditions on that line were extremely difficult. Winter temperatures in that area reached negative 40 degrees, which is a really fun thing to say, because negative 40 is the only time where the Fahrenheit scale and the Celsius scale actually intersect and mean the same temperature. Therefore, I could say negative 40 degrees, and regardless of which temperature scale you use, you know that means really cold! It made it difficult for steam locomotives to generate enough steam in those areas. As a result, they began looking at electrification, 
because there was abundant hydroelectric power in the mountains, as well as a nearby ready source of copper for wiring. Between 1914 and 1916, the road implemented a 3,000 volt direct current overhead system between Harleton, Montana and Avery, Idaho. That was a distance of 438 miles, or 705 kilometers. It worked really well, so they again electrified another route between Othello, Washington and Tacoma, Washington, another 207 miles between 1970 and 1920. At the time, this was actually the largest mainline electrification project in the world, and it wouldn't be exceeded in the United States until the Pennsylvania Railroad's efforts in the 1930s to electrify their own routes. But the thing about this particular electrification project is they never unified the sections of lines. So there was a weird middle section where they had to switch back to steam travel for the trains. It was kind of inefficient in that way, but it did still help. The electrified lines actually saved them over a million dollars per year for a while. And it motivated them to get more electric locomotives, such as the very successful bipolar units. But the Pacific Extension in general still wound up being a complete financial disaster. They never saw a return on the investment the way they expected. In order to meet costs, they actually sold bonds. But those bonds would become being due in the 1920s. Traffic never picked up. To make matters worse, they purchased a bunch of highly indebted railroads in Indiana, for reasons that I still don't fully understand. They finally wound up declaring bankruptcy themselves in 1925, and that's when they finally reorganized the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad in 1928. But they never had a chance to make it through the Great Depression with their financial difficulties, and they had to declare bankruptcy again in 1935. They operated under trusteeship until December 1st, 1945. The post-war boom helped them a lot. They did have good rolling stock, don't get me wrong. They had the famous Hiawatha high-speed steam locomotives. Those things are both distinctive for their streamlining and ability. They exceeded 100 miles per hour, or 160 kilometers an hour, on the regular. It wasn't like the rail line didn't have good things about them, it was just their management style was horrible. But by the 50s, things were going a little bit more downhill. Just like pretty much every railroad during that time, the Milwaukee Road began to see excess competition from both planes and cars. They were also in a particularly weird area where a ton of other railroads were actually outcompeting them very easily. It was overbuilt. And then finally, in 1957, their president, John P. Kiley, resigned and they replaced him with a man by William John Quinn. This was kind of a major moment for the railroad. See, the thing about Quinn is that it isn't necessarily that he was dumb or inept, but he was very inexperienced, and he tended to get fixated on a lot of ideas that never really turned out well, ever. Under Quinn, the railroad began an idea of possibly merging with a larger railroad to bail them out of their troubles. Rather than do anything to fix their situation on their own, they fully expected that they would be attractive enough to line up a merger with another rail line. This pretty much would never actually happen. Hey there, Mr. Union Pacific. You want some of what uh, we're cooking? No. But no? But we're orange. Look at how orange we are, don't you like- No! Please? No! The road kind of waddled along throughout most of the 60s, Quinn even leaving for a short time and then returning to become chairman, while another man, Worthington Smith, would become president of the Milwaukee Road on June 15th, 1972. The 70s are where things really got awkward for the Milwaukee Road. For one thing, they'd already been trying to deal with the constant enemy of railway innovation during the 50s and 60s, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Oh yes, they're back again. And yes, they completely destroyed the Milwaukee Road at every turn. Despite approving the Penn Central merger, in 1969 the ICC blocked the merger that the Milwaukee Road had been counting on with the Chicago and Northwestern Railway. This wasn't because the ICC didn't want to allow it, but they had asked for terms that the Chicago and Northwestern wasn't willing to agree to. At the same time, they had approved the merger of the Hill Lines. This resulted in the formation of Burlington Northern, a major competitor for the already struggling Milwaukee Road. In 1973, things seemed fine, as the Milwaukee Road actually showed an increase in traffic during those years, but nothing was being done to sustain or continue that growth. They still deferred maintenance, with derailments becoming more common, 
and branch line trackage have been bleeding for years, and they allowed those lines to continue running even though they were dragging them backwards. It didn't make any sense. By comparison, Chicago and Northwestern have been trimming its system down, getting rid of unprofitable lines. A lot of rail lines did it that way. They had to in order to stay afloat, but the Milwaukee Road wasn't doing it. That same year, 1973, they were still fixated on the idea of merging with someone else. Did you even want to still be a rail line? I'm just confused at this point. They filed a petition with the ICC, requested to be included in the Burlington Northern merger. This was rejected, because of course it was, as this was counterintuitive to what the ICC had envisioned for rail lines in the northern tier of the states. Milwaukee was supposed to be a competitor to Burlington Northern in that region, a competitor that needed to exist in order for Burlington Northern not to have a monopoly on the area. Burlington Northern didn't even want to merge with them. They broke off talks about it just the following year, stating that the merger wouldn't be in the best interest of Burlington Northern or its stockholders. Hey, Burlington Northern, don't you want a piece of- No! No! No one wants you! Get out of here! You don't have to be so mean about it. The motivations of the actual higher-ups at Milwaukee Road are seriously questionable during this period. The president, Worthington Smith, was quoted as saying that shortly after the merger proposal that the elimination of redundant and unnecessary rail facilities is an absolute must for the future. The timing of him saying that seems to suggest that Smith felt the railroad was redundant. The Milwaukee Road just didn't need to exist anymore. But the traffic charts at the time were up. It suggested that people did want to use the road, but the management didn't see it that way. They also weren't using any extra money they might be generating to maintain their track. The track in some areas was so bad that one time, the Milwaukee Road refused to operate a circus train jointly with the Southern Railway because they were afraid that if the train derailed, animals would run wild. This normally wouldn't be a concern, but the track was that bad and they knew it. Then they also made a really controversial decision. One that was probably one of the most infamous things they did. The electrified portion of their lines that I mentioned before? Well, they had a bunch of copper wiring. Milwaukee decided, hmm, copper prices are at over a dollar a pound and there's 10 million pounds of it hanging over our right of way in the West. Be a shame if someone cut it all down. They decided to shut down electrification. All the electrified lines were shut down and the wires removed and sold off. They also felt that they should have a consolidated system. Before they approached the ICC about that merger with Burlington Northern, remember the one that they didn't actually get? But this was done before they even submitted the petition for inclusion with Burlington Northern. They did look at the idea of rehabilitating the lines. It showed that at the cost of $39 million, the system could be renewed with new locomotives, power supplies, and also close that gap that I mentioned before. If those lines out west were fully electrified, that would have meant $21 million worth of diesel locomotives could be sent back to the east, reducing their net cost there to just $18 million. General Electric even formally proposed financing the project themselves, but Chairman Quinn said no, saying that their company had more immediate needs. This is despite the fact that he knew and admitted that at current traffic levels and fuel prices, the rehabilitated electrification of those lines would have paid for itself in just 11 years, which is a pretty decent turnaround time for a project of that scale. Instead though, they still spent $39 million, the same amount they would have spent to rehabilitate the lines to tear them down and completely dieselize the lines out west, while receiving only $5 million for the copper scrap, as prices by that point had dramatically fallen. Oh, oh, yeah, by the way, it's probably worth mentioning, and this is really important to me, and I want to stress this. This was done during the oil embargo that was going on in the 1970s. The 1970s oil crisis, yeah, that was happening at that point. Running diesel locomotives was actually violently expensive, way more than it ever had been. And this is during a time when electricity prices were remaining fairly stable. By June 15th of 1974, the last electric run was made, and diesels cost twice as much to operate as the electrics did. They still went through with this! The worst part is, in a study that was done by Michael Soule, he found that if the electrification had been done as it existed in 1972, operating at maximum capacity with no additional locomotives, the Milwaukee Road would have saved about $32.6 million by the end of 1977, and $67.8 million by 1980, factoring in the increases in diesel fuel costs. That meant that the renewing the system would have paid for itself in only four years. 
During that time, they also had a really, 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 just unspeakably stupid idea of turning away what they called non-compensatory traffic. Today, a lot of people still aren't sure exactly what the company considered falling under that term, but it was known they had a habit of refusing to supply cars to their customers. The decision to de-electrify the western portion was crippling. In 1975 alone, they lost a total of $37.9 million. In order to compensate for what I can only assume was their complete and unholy inability to actually run a rail line or make any competent decision during this time, the Milwaukee Road had a habit of taking profits from the Milwaukee Land Company. MLC was a wholly owned subsidiary of the railroad, and profits from them were used to prop up profits during lean years on the actual rail lines. Instead of using the money taken from MLC to actually improve the railroad, by the way, it's been shown that they actually used them to finance purchases of the Chicago Milwaukee Corporation, another holding company formed in 1972. Those sales, by the way, weren't reported to stockholders, and that would lead to them getting in trouble with the Securities Exchange Commission, or SEC. In 1975, the SEC would file charges in the federal court accusing the management of the Milwaukee Road of defrauding the company and its shareholders by selling assets without informing the stockholders or the SEC, with deferring maintenance on the track facilities without proper disclosure, and of otherwise falsifying the company books. The investigation that followed found that the MLC had quote-unquote purchased $12 million in land from a company that was owned by Chicago Milwaukee Corporation as an investment, but the land couldn't be identified. While the railroad was struggling and needed money to right itself, Chicago Milwaukee Corp was pulling money out of its subsidiary for its own use. Another interesting fact that came out during the investigation, in fact during a testimony by Worthington Smith himself, concerned Milwaukee's car fleet, the rolling stock. Milwaukee Road had a huge fleet of home-built boxcars, and the Equipment Trust certificates had long been paid off on them. Since there were no longer any finance charges on these cars, they provided a higher return of net revenue. So that's good! But starting in the early 60s, Milwaukee Road had started using these cars as a means of generating cash, by rebuilding a portion of the fleet and reselling them to financial institutions. They would then lease them back to themselves, with the cars never actually leaving the property. Why would they want to do this? Well, it did give them immediate money. It was cheaper to lease a car than outright buy one, and the price they charged for selling them was actually pretty high. They made more money than they would spend on leasing, at least for a few years. But after a while, things started compounding, in 1961, when this practice started, they only spent $3 million on lease charges. That's actually pretty low for a company of this size. But by 1969, that grew to over $20 million. Again, these were cars they used to own, but they weren't paying anything on. But every single year, the situation compounded and got worse and worse and worse. They kept rebuilding, selling, and leasing their own cars back to themselves, while they stopped buying new rolling stock. By 1974, they were spending more on their old, rebuilt fleet than they were on any new cars. And by 1977, they were spending $65 million per year for its own rolling stock while spending less than $20 million on new. It was ridiculous, absurd, insane. And it's considered one of the biggest reasons why that financial situation never improved. As for the SEC's charges against the company, well, the directors wound up entering consent decrees pursuant to which the company agreed to pay contingent bondholders $3.9 million, with additional sums payable according to future profitability of the railroad, which wouldn't actually happen, because it wouldn't be profitable. The total settlement was $4.1 million, and that was to be paid by January 8th, 1978. 1977, though, was kind of the year that everything finally caught up with the road. Deferred maintenance had 4,000 miles of railroad under slow orders. The track conditions were atrocious all over the place, and the main line through Montana was actually averaging a derailment every single day. Yes, a single derailment every day. Every day a train came off the rails. That's horrid. I never even heard of such a thing. Shippers routed their freight over rival lines as schedules became non-existent and transit times went up. 
It used to be that you could get your freight from the Pacific Coast to Chicago in about 55 hours, but now it was taking over 140 hours. Damaged freight totaled just under $10 million for the year, which is never good for any company. And it was much worse than Burlington Northern's damaged freight for that year, $3.6 million. The cost of the derailments, because of course they're expensive, were about $4 million a month. And I'm pretty sure it might have been cheaper to just maintain the friggin' lines! They were also having an equipment shortage, partially due to that leasing thing I mentioned earlier, but also because of a weird policy where they parked any cars that needed more than $500 worth of repairs. They just wouldn't fix them, they just leave them there. Their locomotives were in a similar state. They had a run-to failure policy, and whenever they did finally break, if the locomotive had a major failure, they were also simply parked. They weren't fixed. During that year, the winter in that area was rough, and by the end of it, the lack of maintenance compounded, and half of their fleet was dead in the water. They were out of money, and on December 19, 1977, the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railway filed for reorganization with the Federal Bankruptcy Court in Chicago, Illinois. They did it again. Now, most people would end the story here because by 1985, the Milwaukee Road would be absorbed and taken over by another rail line, the Sioux Line, which was actually a subsidiary of Canadian Pacific. But that wasn't quite the end of the story, at least not as far as the investigation was concerned. A lot of things came out during the bankruptcy proceedings that deeply alarmed the ICC, actually. They wound up auditing the Milwaukee Road's own books which none of the auditors commissioned by the trustee had actually done for the years of 1976 through 1978. They found out that for some reason, the Milwaukee Road had been double entering expenses on lines west. No one ever figured out who authorized this practice or who specifically was doing it, but the auditors found it and were able to derive accurate figures for profits on lines west. What they found was that instead of the completely atrocious money pit that the trustee said it was, the extension had actually contributed profits of $12.7 million in 1976, $11 million in 1977, and $2.9 million in 1978. It's probably worth mentioning that these three years are well into the decline of traffic on the western lines, due to the deteriorated trackage and transit times, and the refusal by the company to supply cars to western customers. The ICC was so alarmed by this that they had another group of auditors go over the books just to be sure they were right. They were. In 1978, Lines West of Miles City, Montana had generated $150 million in revenue. That's alongside the $64 million in business they'd turned away due to lack of car supply. Lines West revenues would have equaled those of Lines East, while having only about 25% of the total route miles and 20% of the employees of the system. The bankruptcy court noted that on average, a carload of transcontinental freight contributed $1,000 towards overhead, while the same carload handled only on lines east contributed only about $100. The ICC concluded that the drop from 1977 to 1978 was due to the trustees' practice of discouraging traffic, which the Milwaukee's own management had started doing in 1974. This information didn't come out till January of 1980. It's ludicrous to think about, because based on this, it almost seems like the suits in charge of the Milwaukee Road wanted the company to fail. Like, they couldn't have been that inept as to do this kind of stuff on purpose, could they? Real talk, they were either stupid or they were intentionally trying to kill the rail line. No evidence in terms of motivations or reasonability has ever come out. Stuff like this can be debated back and forth, but I'm here to give you the facts. The fact is, the Milwaukee Road no longer exists in its original form. On January 1st, 1986, the Milwaukee Road was officially absorbed by the Sioux Line. These days, their original trackage is still used, but it's been divided into a bunch of other large companies. The trackage in South Dakota and Montana is operated by BNSF. Trackage in Washington is now operated by Union Pacific. Trackage in the Midwest is now operated by Canadian Pacific, which again was Sioux Line's parent company. And some trackage in Wisconsin and Illinois is now operated by Wisconsin and Southern Railroad. Rest in peace, Milwaukee Road. You guys are made of madness. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, 7267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, 
Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson, 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Diamond Blade 17, Anzac A1, and Dazzy Wazit. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual fond, farewell.